The final chapter of our journey north through the continent is finally here. The Rhine River, which would take us and our little boat from Switzerland to the sea. This is one of the busiest inland waterways in the world. It is a river with heavy currents, a deep history, far-reaching influences on art and imagination, incredible feats of engineering, and huge economic significance. The Rhine River, our last chapter, and perhaps the most challenging yet. This river was now going to carry us, at sometimes alarming speeds, all the way to salt water. And along the way, we would dodge hundreds of giant commercial ships, see some of Germany's most beautiful regions, and get an up-close view into the industrial underbelly, which makes the Rhine country some of the most prosperous in Europe. So, with nerves on edge, Magic Carpet's bow nosed out into this river of myth and legend, and we were instantly swept along. I'm Maya, and this is Aladino. In mid-November, we converted our 28-foot sailboat into a riverboat, and we started going north, from the Mediterranean all the way to the North Sea. In front of us, we had 2,000 kilometers and 200 locks. Join us as we navigate river currents, discover incredible places, cruise through canals, wait out a global pandemic in the heart of France, and record the whole voyage with a new episode every Friday. This is North Through the Continent. We're going north through the continent. We are entering the Rhine River. I'm very excited how fast it's gonna be. We tried putting the boat in neutral to see just how quickly the current carried us. Wow, we can even go without engine. <laughs> We're going th three knots. Is that the same as before when we had the engine? No, we were going a bit faster. Yeah, we're going two and a half. But to go three knots without engine, we're gonna save a lot on diesel. <laughs> <laughs> but but what we save on diesel here probably still won't make up for what we burned going up the Rhone. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, we just don't have to miss an exit if we ever have one. Otherwise, it's tricky. There were four of us on board, myself and Aladino, of course, along with our friends Luca and Annika. The extra hands would be very helpful for navigating what was to come, plus getting it all on camera to boot. Not that we were expecting too much in the way of scenery, at least for now. In a few days' time, we would be passing through a UNESCO World Heritage Site with castles on nearly every hill, but right now, the scenery consisted of concrete walls and low trees. Hugh McKnight wrote that navigating the Upper Rhine is rather like eating tripe. Interesting for the first few mouthfuls, and exceedingly monotonous thereafter. The reason for this monotony is actually the staggering amount of work that's been done on this section of the river. The section we were traveling on technically isn't even called the Rhine River at all. It's the Grand Canal d'Alsace, a man-made canal that is bigger than both the Panama and the Suez Canals. The Upper Rhine in its former, natural state sometimes reached as wide as three to four kilometers. It was filled with islands, sandbanks, rocks, bends, twists and turns, and other things which made navigation very difficult. But in 1818, the first changes commenced. The river was shaped and shifted by the efforts of man, and by 1876, it was an entire 82 kilometers shorter and considerably narrower, and the work didn't end there. In 1928, work began on the Grand Canal d'Alsace. The grand idea was to move the river entirely from its original path in order to install controlled locks and hydroelectric dams. Imagine this, simply moving the Rhine River. But that's what happened. In present day, the so-called original Rhine runs parallel to the Grand Canal, but we didn't even see it. All we could see were the concrete-lined walls of progress guiding us along to the next lock. We are now a pro 
approaching the first lock for us on the Rhine River. And I'm gonna feel better once we're through it and kind of how we see it, it all goes. Um, like I think we've mentioned before, every lock system is a little bit different. So going up the Rhone and then entering into the Sound River, we had to adjust slightly how we did things from floating bollards to bollards up the wall. And then going into the small canals, we had to adjust again how we did things. And now in the Rhine, it will again be a new system. I am super comforted by the fact that we have so many people on board. That definitely makes things a lot easier rather than one person steering while the other person has to run around doing everything. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're just gonna take it slow. We called ahead to the Eclus or the Schleuse. We're now half French, half German, so we can call them either. So I believe that in the Rhine, I'm pretty sure it's the same as the Rhone, where we have the floating bollards, which makes things a lot easier. Um, so I'm really hoping that's the case. I'm actually not positive, but I think that's true. And yes, I'm also kind of hoping we don't have to come across too much commercial traffic, at least right off the get-go, to sort of figure out the whole system, see how everything operates. The other thing I'm not sure about is, in the Rhone, we always had a pontoon to tie to while we waited for the eight clues to prepare. I'm not sure if that's the same here. I'm no, I don't think that they have dedicated pontoons for pleasure boats to wait for the lock. So that's another thing we just have to see. So we arrived and hovered outside the lock. There was nowhere to tie up. The lockmaster informed us via VHF that we'd just have to wait for a whole lock cycle since there was a double barge coming downriver and we wouldn't be able to fit into the lock with it. So we waited. That's a lot of junk. You're always ready to go schlafen. <laughs> Especially if I didn't schlaf enough. Not much of a sport boot over here, are no. we? So everything is bigger here in dimension and we have a huge weir, but it like it's divided. It's like the complete complete similar section like here parallel to us and actually we don't have any current at all where we are right now and that makes waiting for the lock very comfortable instead of having to fight the current so yeah this is a pleasant surprise okay we are waiting and it's waiting we're again. We're waiting for another boat and then we're going behind because this time we fit. <laughs> so there's the other one that we had to wait for. Nevada lumbered slowly towards the lock. We had now been floating around here for well over an hour, which gave me plenty of time to stew about all the things which could go wrong with this new locking experience. The thing I'd heard about most frequently is that the propeller wash from these huge ships in such close proximity can be enormous, and we were now entering directly behind one. With some nervous anticipation, we headed slowly in. Now we had heard that the Rhine locks have floating bollards, similar to the Rhone. This would make things much easier if we didn't have to adjust our lines as we sank down. But as we came closer, we realized that the starboard bollard which we were aiming for wasn't a floating one at all. There was only one floating bollard to our port, so we quickly scrambled around with fenders to switch sides. But then we realized that we may have entered the lock altogether too early. Nevada let out a big stream of wash from her propeller, presumably a reverse gear to settle into position. She had been moving so slowly that we thought she was already in place. And the wash from this 3,000 ton monster buffeted our three and a half ton boat around like a toy. There were a few tense moments to get the lines on the bollard. Awesome, we made it. 
But once everything was secure, the locking process was actually really smooth and easy. We were glad we had avoided the bollards on the right side of the lock and opted for the floating one instead. Line handling was a breeze. We did get quite nervous when it was time for Nevada to maneuver out, but the prop wash wasn't too bad at all, and it went smoothly. Good job, everybody! Yay! One of 207 locks. No. <laughs> this time we only have 15. Isn't that crazy? The dimensions are quite impressive, aren't they? The other boat fills like the whole thing, and we're such a little cute boat bouncing right. around from one side to the other. Okay, so the first lock on the Rhine River is behind us now and there were definitely some things that we learned about the new locking system that we'll now have to follow and then there were some things that went really well, especially compared to the Rhone because we're kind of comparing everything to our voyage on the Rhone River in November. So things that we need to uh, pay attention to in the next few ones is when we came into the lock, um, there's like these recesses in the wall and we kind of assumed that in all of those recesses would be a floating bollard because that was kind of the case on the Rhone. Uh, but that's not the case here. A lot of the recesses are ladders with no bollards nearby and some of them are bollards that like go down the wall, which is also possible, but it's just a little bit more complicated. So definitely to find the floating bollards makes things a lot easier. The other thing is that we had to come in behind the commercial ship, which I think will be pretty standard, and there was a lot of wash. So I think we went in maybe a little bit too early because after a while he did cut his wash down as we were um, going down. So I think next time we'll give the boat in front of us a lot of time to get ready, cut the wash, and then we'll go in, and I think that'll make it a lot easier as well. The things that went really well though is it's so much easier going down a lock rather than going up so that's really really nice and it also just makes all the difference in the world to have the extra hand on board uh, with Luca helping. It just makes everything easier because when it's just the two of us in the lock uh, it's just a lot more to handle all at once. So yeah. Um, I think we have a much better idea of what the rest of the locks will look like now and I think we're in a good spot. <laughs> I'm, I'm feeling good. I was very nervous before this lock, but feeling good now. changing so rapidly. I was so looking forward to sunshine because the weather prediction said one week of sunshine and sunscreen and really blue skies but uh, it doesn't look like that at all right now. And it's getting cold. Yeah and it's quite windy actually. If you leave in that fine, don't forget your now we wait here of our life <laughs> for what for well one boat is in the lock right now for them to do the locking and then uh, we can go behind Nevada which is waiting I'm pretty surprised actually it's the same boats that we were locking with before so we caught up and we're going almost the same speed how crazy is that I would have definitely not imagined that we waited and when allowed we motored in we were behind the same ship again, and this time we had an easier go of it. Wall against the hook. Yes. Hook. 
Yeah, Hot Wings? Hot Wings? Yeah, look it up. Ooh, Wings <laughs> numero 2. I am pretty done for today, but we have one more at Nick. about an hour distance from here. Yay, we made it to the third lock. The first one was Otmarsheim, Fest and something, and now it's Vogelgrund. So I'm gonna get ready to give him a call. Schleuse Vogelgrund, Schleuse Vogelgrund, das ist Sportboot Magic Carpet. Ja, guten Abend. Guten Abend. Ich wollte fragen, ob wir hinter Nevada rein können oder ob wir abwarten auf den nächsten Schleusengang. Danke. Ja, äh, die nächste, äh, das wird die große. Äh, wenn die Talfahrt nachher eingefahren ist, können Sie dann hinterher, aber lassen Sie eine gute Sicherheit äh, Abstand ab. Alles klar, wir warten, danke. Nein! What did he say? Yes, so we I didn't wait. understand. We, we, we had to wait, but then something, something about, about the Talfahrt, when the Talfahrt, but we had to have to wait uh, just like a lot of distance to be yeah. careful. He said, he said to keep distance and be careful for yeah. part of the movement of the Anyway. Wow, it looks exactly the same again. It's like six <laughs> hours we're traveling and we're like getting exactly into the same place again. <laughs> stop the strudel! Stop your strudel! What? Stop the German? Stop! Oh! With the S. Stop! This time we were heading into a double wide lock, big enough to fit two commercial ships side by side. But now we were in the lock with a different ship, and it seemed like their prop wash wasn't subsiding. We hung back for a while waiting for it to calm down, but the lock keeper started rushing us into the lock via the radio. So we headed in against our better judgment, and sure enough, we had a difficult time again. I was very grateful we had Luca to help on deck and Annika to get the whole thing on film. Although it's hard to see in the video, the current from this huge ship was enough to actually pin us against the wall, and even at full throttle we weren't able to move forward. I have to admit, this was not the most enjoyable day of boating. Okay, we are arriving finally in Braisa. In Applause! Applause, no. indeed. But I am ready for a holiday. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that I read about the Rhine River sort of said like it, it, it's a place that you go if you need to get somewhere, but it's not necessarily the place that you go for pleasure boating unless you're in specific sections of the Rhine, which are really nice. I think there are very beautiful sections that will come. But today was really quite a slog and there was a lot of very large boats, uh, which I don't think will change. I think the large boats will stay pretty consistent, but I think the surroundings will at least become a little bit nicer and there might be more um, things to do with pleasure boats as we get further down as well. At least I hope so. Because actually right now is the first sign of pleasure boats we've seen the whole day, the first dock the first anything. There has been zero pleasure boat infrastructure from here until now. So yeah, it was a bit of a slog. Um, perhaps not the best day for Annika to come and join us and see what boat life is about, but uh, she was a very good sport about it and I'm so thankful for all the videos that she took. There are always multiple layers to a travel story. First, there's the big overall plot, the thread that weaves the whole journey together. And then from there, there's the day-to-day -day stories, which actually make up the voyage itself. Right here on the left. 
For our journey right now, the overall plot fascinates me. The Rhine River is one of the most important rivers in Europe. It has shaped history and economics. It stopped the Romans from pressing farther north, and to this day it acts as the border between France and Germany. It is a huge economic driver. It has inspired arts and artists for centuries. It even contributed to the creation of a German identity. There are a lot of pivotal stories which live along these riverbanks, but the day-to-day -day of actually traveling down the river, so far that hasn't been nearly as impressive. It's one thing to know about the huge engineering feat of creating the Grand Canal d'Alsace, but it's another thing to drive past the monotonous concrete walls and wait for the monstrous ships while treading water in front of the massive locks. As the sun faded away, I didn't mourn the day. I was looking forward to having the Upper Rhine behind us. I had heard that there were more beautiful sections to come, although at the time, I was unaware of the added challenges those more beautiful sections would bring. But those stories are still yet to come. Thank you so much to all of you for watching, and I also want to say a big thank you to Annika and Luca for really helping us out with this episode. Luca's help on deck and Annika's help behind the camera uh, definitely contributed a lot to making this episode what it is. And as always, a giant thank you to our patrons for making this entire journey and film series possible. It really wouldn't exist without you guys, so thank you so much. And an extra big thank you to these folks who really go the extra mile to make sure that these videos keep happening. We will see you all next week.